Uh, I'm Melissa Capuano. I know Pearl probably tried to attempt that last name, but I don't blame you for, for not going with it. Uh, I'm here with Ashley. Ashley, it's great to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, and thank you. Thank you for joining our panel today. Uh, I'm really excited for our chat. We have uh, a lot to get through in the next 40 minutes. I want to touch on everything from that world famous culture that, uh, uh, sorry, just got to um, that Yum Brands has created. And then I want to get into sort of your day to day with your team and how you're embracing new innovations in the QSR space. But before we dive into that, let's talk a little bit about you and your own professional journey because you've worked for some other great brands along the way. You've worked for Frito-Lay and Starbucks, uh, most recently Amazon. What is it that drew you to Yum? Uh, thanks, Melissa. I'm really happy to be here. Excited for the discussion. Um, I would say what really drew me to Yum, first I wanted to go back to retail. Um, I had missed kind of the fast-paced environment of that uh, convergence of the, both the physical um, and the, the digital retail space. Um, but more than anything, it was the culture. Um, I had heard of several people that I had formerly worked with at, at Frito-Lay and other companies that had gone to, to work with Yum, and they couldn't say enough about what an amazing culture it was. And so that's really what drew me to the company, this people-first culture, this um, idea of putting the human and the person uh, before the job. Uh, I, and when I joined, I... You know, of course, you hear that about a lot of companies. They always talk about their culture, but having been here for two and a half years now, uh, it's never been more true. And I just can't believe I, I landed it at a place that really values every single person that they work with. It's a warm environment. It's a recognition culture, uh, and I just couldn't be happier. Well, that's great. Yeah, like I said at the top of this, it's uh, you know, Yum is well known for their culture. But let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, you started in, it was the summer of 2019, right? So you had kind of like the six to eight months of uh, quote unquote normal. And then all of a sudden the world changed. How did the company adapt to that and, and maintain that culture when, you know, everything was changing so rapidly day to day? Yeah, I would say first and foremost, it was a huge shift for us that work at the global headquarters um, in the US because we were traveling a lot. And my first six months, I was able to visit Moscow and London and France and Australia and New Zealand and really got to really kind of be boots on the ground and understand how the brand shows up in all of these countries around the world. And then the world stopped. Of course, there was no more traveling. There was no more even going into the office. And so um, before that, we didn't have video conferencing. We never, it's hard to believe that at a global company, we didn't do Zoom and Microsoft Teams. So we had to very quickly shift to that. Um, and what it did is it allowed us to collaborate even more. And we have, so we're regularly meeting um, around the world and we're learning more from each other. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to that. And I would say from a culture perspective, um, it strengthened our culture. Um, it made us lean into it even further in caring about people. The company has given us, you know, extra days off, mental health days to make sure um, that we're, we're caring for, for our families, that we're caring for ourselves. Um, we have a lot of sessions and um, education and uh, additional benefits uh, for, you know, mental health, um, for physical health that the company has provided. Um, so really um, leaning into that people first mentality is, I think, what has really um, saved us uh, over the course of the past couple of years. I love that. And, and I, I love that your company um, prioritizes mental health because it's something that uh, we share at, at Odyssey here too. Um, shifting gears a little bit, I mean, you talked about the fact that you traveled, which sounds very glamorous. I know that travel can also be not so glamorous at times, <laughs> but, um, you know, under the Yum! Brands umbrella, you've got, uh, you know, in addition to KFC, there's 26,000 different restaurants. You're in 150 countries. I was surprised at this statistic that 86% of the restaurants are outside of the U.S. I always think of these brands as being iconic U.S. brands. Um, but how do you, you know, approach that where, you know, you got to think globally, but act locally. You're, you're, you're engaging with so many different cultures. How mm -hmm. does that uh, come to life? Well, let's say 
traditionally, historically, we've been very decentralized um, at, at KFC. And in the fact that we have, you know, 18 major business units around the globe that are responsible for, for running their business. But as we've kind of gotten into technology, what we've realized is that doesn't work so well for technology. Uh, it's really hard for a small market with 10 stores to be able to launch an app with world-class functionality. Um, and what we've realized, especially when it comes to digital innovation and technology is that we have a lot more in common across markets than we do differently. So we really need to determine what is in common across markets that really allow us to innovate and scale quickly and get capabilities in the market as quickly as possible, but also maintaining that flexibility within that framework so that each individual market can ensure that the brand is showing up in a really locally relevant way. Because that's very important to our brand. Um, you know, people in, in Australia think KFC is an Australian brand. People in the UK like love KFC and, and forget sometimes, you know, that it, that it can be an American brand. And, and we don't want to lose that, that local relevancy. Um, you know, so for us, you know, success really looks uh, looks like, you know, no matter where you are in the world, when we are the first brand that you think of when craving for something indulgent strikes you and we're the easiest brand to access. So uh, however, we can scale technology as quickly as possible um, across all markets, but maintain that local flexibility is, is a big win for us. Yeah. Um you know, it, 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 that's very interesting. I remember when we were uh, chatting previously, you had mentioned that about Australia, which I just love. That means you're doing it right, right? They don't even think about Kentucky. They think that that's a brand that's an Australian brand. Um, so let's like dive in a little bit to your, your digital strategy. And you spoke a little bit about that, but, you know, kind of back to the pandemic, um, you know, your first six months in this role, you came in and you approached it a certain way. Uh, which was really traveling, uh, you know, to all the different countries. And then once the pandemic hit, things changed. Just speak a little bit to that shift, because I know you're, you're trying to do things and like look for best practices that, that kind of work um, at scale. But, uh, you know, speak to sort of the shift in mindset, because there are a lot of countries you went to uh, where they said, we don't need a digital strategy. And all of a sudden, things changed. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, three years ago at QSR, it was all about convenience. And at that time, convenience was about store location. And while that still is the case, convenience means something different today uh, than it did uh, two and a half years ago. And so, you know, prior when I first joined the company, we had a really small team um, really trying to say, hey, you know, you need to be able to do delivery and do collect like that's the future. And, you know, it was hard for some teams to kind of wrap their head around that being the future of our business, especially when business was doing really well. Um, so we don't, you know, we don't need to change. Things are going well. But then, of course, when the pandemic struck, that shift in customer behavior that we were seeing just, you know, got um, catapulted into the future. Um, so then there became a pull of how quickly can we get these capabilities in the market? Um, so it just kind of really ramped up what we thought it would take five years to do. We needed to figure out how to do it in one. Um, so that's really the kind of the shift in mindset. And what comes along with that is finding the right talent to help us innovate and get um, into the future um, and surpass customer expectations as quickly as possible. And then also um, up leveling the capabilities of the talent we have um, and finding new ways to, to teach them how to be you know, digital marketers of the future. So, you know, when you're looking for talent and, and um, your, your strategizing, like, share with us a little bit of um, how KFC differentiates itself you know, in this space, um, because, you know, we've heard a, from a lot of other brands today and, you know, everybody's doing different things to try and approach it. And I would say this category in general is, is in the infancy of what, you know, it can be. There's, there's a lot that's happening every day, new innovations and digital technologies. So, you know, as a brand, what is KFC doing to differentiate itself uh, as it pertains to e-commerce, customer acquisition, and then customer loyalty and engagement? Well, I would say um, if you subscribe to Byron Sharp's philosophy, you'd say there's no such thing as loyalty. <laughs> and in QSR, that's actually pretty true. I mean, rarely are you going to find someone that 
only goes to KFC or that only goes to Taco Bell and doesn't go to any other QSR restaurant. I mean, we're human beings. We like to explore. We're in the mood for different things. Uh, so where we really differentiate ourselves at KFC is in our delicious food. Um, it's when you're craving something indulgent, when you're craving delicious fried chicken sandwich covered in gravy, maybe there's a hash brown in there and cheese. And yes, that really does exist. <laughs> and when you when you really want something indulgent, you're going to think of us first. Um, and it's about being top of mind in that moments of crave, those moments of hunger. Um, and we use the philosophy that um, Ken Munch and, and Greg Creed have a book out now called the um, the uh, All About Being Red, and that's about being relevant, easy, and distinctive. And I think historically, when we thought about e-commerce. We thought about it in that ease, like how do we just make us, you know, KFC easy to access. But now what we're realizing is that we have to be both relevant and distinctive too throughout all of our digital products that we build. We need to be relevant through the data that we use um, and through, you know, personalization and making sure that we're providing or showing you the most relevant um, products uh, to, to you that you would crave, that you would want. And then when it comes to the distinctiveness of our, of our digital products and our digital innovation, um, you know, we're still exploring that. Uh, we have a lot of exciting things coming. So, uh, you know, not a lot I can talk about today, but I would say in the past couple of years, we've been playing catch up um, and, you know, we're at a point to, to um, super step change kind of where we are from a distinctiveness in the digital innovation. So more to come on that. Right. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you and I spoke about that in terms of uh, customer loyalty programs and, and building that out. When you, when you talk about relevancy in the digital space, you know, what is the most challenging space? I mean, some of the, what we've heard from other brands today is they've talked about, especially social media and TikTok as big as that is today. Um, how do you react in real time to things that are trending culturally there? You know, that is where our decentralized structure that we have really benefits us as an organization. Um, by having these business units run individually, you've got local people running those businesses. It's not like we have teams of Americans all over the world running the business. It's people that live and breathe that culture that are, you know, living there. And so they're able to respond um, on, on their, to their own, they, they run their own marketing. Um, and a lot of our, you know, franchisees in some markets run their own marketing and they understand their culture and they understand what is relevant, um, in that market, um, and have the freedom to, to respond to those things. Um, so I think that is what, what allows us to be so locally relevant. No, that's, that's a great point and, and super important. Um, looking at other brands out there, whether it's in the QSR, category or not, what brands are inspiring you or are you are the brands that are really doing it right? Um, well, I have to say, I think first and foremost, um, I would have to say probably Starbucks. And it's always going to have a near and dear um, place in my heart. Uh, and I just love how they keep growing and expanding upon what we built together when I was there. Um, but I really also love what Sephora is doing because they've managed to not just have a loyalty program, but also bring personalization and a real sense of community together into one experience. Um, and they have a really great way of incentivizing behavior without being too obvious about it. Because somehow I ended up with a whole drawer of makeup and this fabulous lipstick, which I never would have worn a year ago, something so bold. Um, and I still don't know how that happened, but I, that I have this drawer full of makeup, but they must have done something to incentivize that behavior because it happened. No, well, trust me, it happens to me too, with many, many other brands. And, uh, and we're all like trying new things during the pandemic, right? Like new lipstick, so it looks different on Zoom than in person. So it looks great. Um, so, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about emerging trends. What are you following? What are you seeing? Uh, uh, what, what's next in the QSR space? Um, I would say, I would say the one thing that really keeps me up at night is how fast customer expectations are really shifting. 
I mean, in QSR, we often want to compare our digital experiences to other QSRs. So it's very, it would be very easy for us as, as KFC, for example, and we're building the app and we're ideating on new features in the app to think about well, what's McDonald's doing or what's, what's Chick-fil-A doing. But the reality is the customers are not comparing our app to other QSRs. Their expectations are formed by all of their digital interactions and, or their, even their meta interactions. Um, their order flow expectations are formed you know, by aggregators. Their perceptions are influenced by Netflix, by Amazon. And customers don't really care that Amazon has 20,000 people kind of running their, their web and app to make it personalized and, and to make ordering easy. Um, and that maybe we only have five people. They really don't care. They're experiencing customization, personalization, one-click ordering, gamification, um, connection to the meta metaverse, NFTs, crypto. They're experiencing all of these things through all of their touch points and they expect you to deliver them too. Um, and so our amazing, we have an amazing internal insights team um, that revealed some research that said coming out of the pandemic that we're all operating on this like fifth grade mental level. Um, customers, they no longer want to do any of the thinking. They want you to do the thinking for them because cognitive overload is at an all-time high. Um, and that doesn't seem to be changing. So it's just that our like bar has raised exponentially in terms of being able to stay on top of, of these trends innovate on all of these things um, and remove any of the tension and any of the friction that we can uh, from the customer experiences. And, um, you know, this is a tall order because it causes us all to shift in how we think about our business and how we think about the products we develop. Um, and so that's the big trend I see is us having to um, not lose our traditional retail experiences. And that's what makes um, our, our business so great, but also become like digitally innovative companies um, at the same time. Uh, and it's, it's super challenging, but it's also super exciting and, and why I love it so much. Well, uh, yeah, you know, talking about the consumer experience and we're talking a lot about digital and, and um, you know, capturing the customer there, uh, making it easy. Uh, I love that. I'm, I'm a person that uses apps for that, that reason too. But how do you make that connection that uh, from uh, the digital the technology and interacting there with like a real human experience, the connection between, you know, the app and the in-store experience? Yeah, I mean, honestly, digital innovation should really make those human connection moments more special. Uh, it should replace some of the functional task oriented things like ordering, for example, uh, but never replace the human touch uh, when someone needs help or just needs a smile. Uh, technology should free up our team members in the store to do what they love, to hand bread our chicken and cook and to connect with customers. And so if we can leverage technology to kind of remove some of those tasks and free up their time and capacity to enjoy their work um, and enjoy connecting with customers, that's when I think we've gotten technology right um, and it found that right balance. And do you think, you know, uh, and again, I'll go back to just kind of watching some of these sessions uh, today, uh, and you touched on it a little bit, like with the pandemic, we talked about how that affected the culture within the company, um, you know, how what your approach, your digital strategy is, but what about changing consumer behaviors? And, and while we're, um, I agree, operating at a fifth grade uh, level here on cognitive overload. Are there trends that came from the pandemic specifically that you had to adapt, adapt to? Anything that you think will stick? Oh, a lot. I think a lot of, uh, I think a lot of things will stick because, you know, they say it takes, uh, what is it? They, they always say in January when you're doing New Year's resolutions, it takes like three weeks or three months to form a habit. Well, we've yeah. had two and a half years to develop yeah. these new habits. So I don't think we're just going to go back to where we were in 2019 ever. Um, so, you know, things like 
ordering ahead and picking up in store, things like delivery, curbside, really it's having choice of access. I think customers now expect and want that control of, I want to be able to go and sit down in a restaurant if I want to, but I also want to be able to, if I'm in a hurry, order ahead and just zoom in and pick it up. But I also want to be able to order ahead and stay in my car and go in the drive through because I have toddlers in the back and don't want to get them out. And so they want options um, and they want control over choosing when, how, uh, they get their food. And so I think it's on all of us to figure out um, how to not just provide those options, but make those options as easy as possible. And so, um, you know, that's the biggest trend I think uh, will stick around. And I think there's, there's another trend uh, that I've been reading about recently, which I think is really interesting. In that in the beginning of the pandemic, everyone had to cook at home. Um, you know, yes, you could order delivery, but there was just a lot of grocery delivery and a lot of home cooking. And now that we've kind of started to emerge from that, a lot of people are eating out more uh, than they have. It's still doing a lot of delivery and collect, um, but are just tired of cooking. And so what's going to be interesting to see what happens is finding that balance because the trend that I, you know, that I've been reading about is about how people are going to, a QSR is going to play a really important role, grab and go is going to play a really important role as people try and, and, and find that balance of, you know, getting back to normal lives, but still kind of being like over, like overrun by, or like, uh, by having to cook and, and having to, to manage their, um, their own food. I don't understand that trend because honestly, I love to cook. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, so it's actually been really interesting to, to me, for me to read about it and try and understand a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I'm with you. I, I love to cook and it was kind of nice for a couple of months to be cooking at home, uh, every single night, but then I will admit that it was also nice to finally get back out and not <laughs> to be forced to do that all the time. Um, you know, you, you came from Amazon, you spent some time there. Uh, you know, any best practices? I think that there's, a, you know, a lot of people, a lot of brands in, in, you know, marketers that look to Amazon in terms of e-commerce doing it really well. Anything that the QSR industry can pick up from what Amazon is doing right? Um, yeah, I think there's several things. Um, I think being a customer centric, um, Organization. So, you know, a lot of what you read about Amazon and, and, and it's true in a lot of ways within the company that they're always thinking about what's going to help the customer, what's going to be most beneficial to the customer um, down to like what the products that they develop. So I think from a QSR perspective, um, I think we have two customers. We have the end consumer of our products, and then we also have our team members in the store. So how do we start to think of them both as customers and ensure that every decision that we're making, every strategy that we're developing, we have the voice of, of our customer in the room with us to push us and challenge us um, to make sure that, you know, we're not making their lives more difficult, we're making their lives easier. And so I think that's one, um, one thing we can really take from, from Amazon. And then I think the other is leveraging technology and infrastructure to provide more relevancy to customers. So things like a content management system to dynamically change what products we show and when, um, having things like a, um, an interface that allows um, a, someone who, uh, who can't code in SQL, who can't write SQL to actually go in and uh, do customer segmentation to try and get an understand, a better understanding of customer behavior to, to drive insights into the business. Um, so I think there's just a lot of um, uh, pieces of, of the backend technology within Amazon that bringing it into the QSR space could really um, unlock some, some new capabilities for us. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, we talked before just about knowing as much as you can about your customers and how they engage with the brand so that you're making it easy for them. You kind of know if they are typically feeding a family of four or five, that's kind of what you're going to push out first yeah. um, for them to, to make it easy. I love that. Um, you know, I know you're not like in, you know, uh, menu uh, research and development, but you, know, you talked about the amazing fried chicken and the mashed potatoes with gravy and all of the great menu products. 
anything, you know, new coming? Is there, um, you know, or any new campaigns that are that are coming up that you want to speak to? Um, not necessarily campaigns, but you know, the in the US, we just um, launched the Beyond Fried Chicken, which is a really amazing product for anyone with small uh, children where the crunchiness of the chicken can be challenging. I know with my one year old and even my three year old, um, they don't really like the, cr the crispy kind of outer coating. Uh, the Beyond Fried Chicken actually has like a softer coating um, that uh, kids tend to really love uh, from, from everything I've heard. Um, and it really speaks to the this trend that we're seeing. Uh, yes, there's a, a trend for vegan and vegetarianism, but more than that, there's this trend in um, uh, this like flex in this flexible eating, this flexitarian of like, well, I'm gonna go, you know vegetarian on Mondays or, you know, meat, have meatless Mondays, or I'm going to go, I have a friend of mine that goes um, vegan Monday through Thursday, but then on the weekends, um, you know, she'll, she'll indulge a little bit. So I think this kind of flexitarian providing options for that, um, for people to enjoy and, and work together is, um, uh, we're going to see a lot more of in, in a lot of our, our markets. So it, it's something to, to keep an eye on. Well, I, I love the term flexitarian. I have never heard that before, but I'm going to use that. I would consider myself a flexitarian. Um, I used to use 80-20 rule where, you know, you, you have your indulgences once in a while, but flexitarian is nice. Let's switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about um, corporate social responsibility. And I know it's not exactly your, your area, but um, just in general, like especially when it comes to reaching the, the Gen Z consumer, because I know a lot of brands try and reach the Gen Z consumer and try and connect. And we know that that particular consumer, it's, it's very important that the brands they choose have shared values. What are some of those values that KFC has and, and how do you communicate it to that audience? Yeah, I can't speak to the strategy in and of itself. Um, my colleague, my colleague Kim, kind of leads that team, and they're doing some. I mean, they're an amazing team. They're doing some really incredible work. Um, but I would say, you know, what you you can you know read in a lot of our earnings reports and kind of where our focus is is um, really in um, in sustainability um, is a big focus sustainability for the environment, sustainability of our products and our packaging. Um, then uh, secondly is, is locally sourced and, and ethically sourced uh, uh, chicken and, and products. And then the third um, is our, our people and making sure that it's not just diversity, but more even more so than diversity, it's inclusion uh, and making sure everyone has a seat at the table. Those three um, are, are really important to our brand. Um, and you know, I think a lot of brands say that, but the amount of investment of time, money, resources we're putting behind making sure we're doing the right thing in all of those areas is, um, is really remarkable and really inspiring to me to work for a company that's walking the walk. Um, so I, I, I have no doubt you'll hear more in all three of those areas uh, in the uh, coming months. But I would say from a digital innovation perspective, one of the trends that we're seeing is the importance of needing to make all of those things easy for customers to see and hear about. Um, you know, yes, while a lot of people say that those things are really important in choosing where they're going to spend their money and what brand they're going to associate with, the reality is we're all human beings. And most people, I would argue 99% of people when choosing where to have lunch are not going to go and research all these QSRs and see who's doing the best for the environment or for people before making a decision. They're hungry. They want something they're just going to choose. But they also want to feel good and validated during the ordering experience or right afterwards. So some of the innovation that we're looking at that we're testing right now in, in several markets is um, like product tags. So um, in, in Canada, we have bamboo buckets. So why not put a tag on that to say, hey, this is a compostable bucket. Um, so while you're in the middle of ordering a bucket of fried chicken, your guilt is a little bit lessened because you're oh, at least I'm doing something good for the environment. This is great. Um, and then the same thing with like our vegan items and our vegetarian items, just making it really easy for customers to know that not only is this a plant-based option, but it's also vegan. And so they can feel confident that this isn't in the same fryers as our fried chicken. And, um, this, uh, so just doing, um, 
uh, just trying to make that all of those things really easy, not just for P, not for PR and for recognition, uh, but to help our customers in their decision making. Yeah, no, I think that's really smart and so important. You're right. It's 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 while a lot of people say that's important to them personally, you're right. They're hungry. They're not going to stop and research it. But if you're doing a good job at communicating that, I think that's that's really smart. Um, so, you know, you have a great culture there at Young Brands. You have uh, KFC is, um, you're, you're absolutely right. It's amazing chicken and, and all of the menu items um, are, are just hands down, it's the best. You're recruiting. Do you want to talk a little bit about that being such a great place to work and, and such a, uh, you know, innovative brand? Yeah, I would say we're doing some really amazing things. We have really strong ambitions um, and we're, we're growing our, our digital team and innovation team. We're hiring uh, technology talent. We're hiring um, uh, people in the strategic space. Um, so, uh, you know, we have a lot of opportunities, not just at, at our global headquarters, but also in our, in our markets. Um, so, um, you know, definitely uh, feel free to reach out to me if, if you're interested in one of the things that um, uh, I love about where we're coming out of the pandemic uh, from, a, from a company standpoint is flexibility. So while before the pandemic, our entire digital team sat in Dallas, now we consist of people that live in Australia, Singapore, uh, Chicago, LA, Seattle, uh, Atlanta, like we really are a truly global team. Um, and there's no expectation that everyone's going to move to Dallas. We're going to stay in, you can live wherever you want uh, and, and come work for us. And so, uh, so it's a really exciting um, opportunities to, to really kind of drive innovation um, with an amazing culture, but have that flexibility to work where and how you want to. Well, I'm, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of inquiries uh, after today. Um, I'm going to turn it over because we've had a question come in uh, on, the, on the chat here. Uh, with the increase focused on digital, can you speak to how you're leveraging first party data and how that can lead to better product recommendations that you mentioned before? So, you know, you kind of spoke to a little bit about that in terms of making it easy for con uh, customers and consumers. But how are you leveraging the first party data? Yeah, I would say, I mean, all of that should come from, from first, any type of recommendation or personalization should come from first, first party data. Um, I have very little trust in a lot of third party data out there. Um, I think it's great for, for trends and, and uh, for insights, um, but to actually use it for, for targeting and for recommendations uh, gives me a little anxiety. Um, maybe it's my trust issues coming out, I don't know. Um, so I think you know building your, your first party data ecosystem um, has never been more important uh, than, it is, than it is today and doing it in a way that's secure and safe and transparent. Um, at Starbucks, you know, uh, obviously they're one of the best. Um, and when we were, you know, creating the personalization capabilities at Starbucks and these like individual challenges that everyone's, you know, challenges, star dashes and stuff that you see in your, your app or your emails are individualized to you specifically. Um, when we were talking about those capabilities, we used the creepy versus cool factor. Um, so do we, did the, does the customer know why we have this information about them and why it's extremely relevant? Um, if we got this from a place that wasn't transparent, then just don't use it. Um, that's it. it it's just not ethical. So there's that balance that we're going to have to continue, I think, to, to find as we start to use first party data. I think having that filter um, to make sure that we're doing the right thing and we're safeguarding customer information um, in the right way um, and using it ethically is going to be extremely important. Is there any example of sort of first party insight that, uh, insight that shifted your mindset about um, how, how you would use first party data? Um, I mean, probably nothing different than anyone else in terms of like talking about something and all of a sudden seeing it in your newsfeed, um, or <laughs> yeah. my husband searched for something on his phone, but yet I got an ad for it on my newsfeed. Like to me, that's totally crossing the creepy line. Creepy. Um, so, uh, that really opened my eyes to, um, 
uh, to the use of third party data um, and just being a little bit more mindful um, of, um, of that. So um, not to say that those insights couldn't, you know, really, um, uh, really be useful, but uh, those kinds of uh, situations uh, are just really kind of opened my mind because they seem to be happening, happening more and more than ever before. Oh yeah, and and you're right. It's it's creepy. Um, another question came in through the chat. So staying on first party data for a second, how important is it for you to rely on a media partner's first party data um, on top of your own? Um, I can't. I I can't speak to that super reliably because I work global and I'm not kind of running the media um, yeah. in, a, in a particular market, but I will say um, nothing is more important than relying on our own first party data. And um, it's of utmost importance that we kind of beef that up and we um, really make sure that it's clean and it's safe. Um, and that is a huge priority for us as a company. Thank you, Ashley. And uh, any other questions? We have a few more minutes here that can come in through the chat. But um, you know, while we're waiting for that, I'll uh, I'll ask a, a question selfishly here. We're Odyssey. We're an audio company. So, um, tell me what you're listening to. Oh my gosh! Uh, so I listen to a lot. I listen or a lot of different variety of music. Um, I'm the type of person that I don't do well in silence. I always have to have something in the background. Um, I have a very eclectic taste in music except for EDM, my husband is really into, I call it beats without words. I have to have <laughs> lyrics. Um, so right now I really, um, I do Peloton. So I kind of have my Peloton hearted songs, which ranges everything from like nineties hip hop to, to today to country. Um, so that's a big favorite of mine, uh, but I also like listening to local radio stations. Um, that's great. And, so yeah, but in, in podcast wise, um, I'm listening to, to Brene Brown's Dare to Lead podcast. Mm -hmm. um, I love that really amazing interviews um, that she does. And she's just very in inspiring. And then my husband has recently gotten me into true crime. Um, so uh, I tried to stay away from it as long as I can, but it just really, really uh, sucks you in. Yeah, it does. That sucks me into. That's kind of like one of my go-tos is a uh, true crime. Um, we're coming up on time here. So my, uh, my, my final question, unless anything comes in is, you know, what is one thing that you think other brand marketers um, should know, whether that's about, um, you know, the QSR category marketing in general, what, what are some of the lessons that you've learned that you would say, like, this is really important? Yeah, I think that one piece of advice would be to not be afraid to um, try new things in your career. Um, I started out as a very traditional marketer, um, you know, traditional CPG brand marketing at Frito-Lay. When I went to Starbucks, it was very traditional retail marketing. And I got the opportunity to, to make the, the transition into digital. And, you know, it was, it was frightening at first because I didn't really know a lot about technology, um, but I had a hunger to learn and wanted to explore that space. And I think the lines between traditional marketing and digital are blurring and they're blurring more quickly than ever before. So even traditional brand marketers are going to have to understand content management systems. They're going to have to understand how to use data to um, make the brand show up in a relevant way on a personalized level. And that doesn't mean you have to know how to code. That doesn't mean you have to go back to school. That just means asking questions and being curious um, and building relationships with your technology counterparts. And I think, you know, building relationships with uh, the technical product managers that I've worked with um, at Starbucks and at Amazon and asking them questions um, helped kind of gain my skill set. Um, and it's helped me kind of really be able to balance this bridge of marketing and technology and understanding how to use these products that these talented people develop and build uh, to drive the business. And so I would just encourage everyone um, to, you know, don't chase titles, don't chase companies or promotions, really chase growing your skill set and your capabilities because these lines are going to continue to be blurred and the more diverse you can be, the better off you'll be. A hundred percent. We see that in our industry too, as, as audio has, has shifted from, you know, just your local radio station to streaming, wow. podcasting, and uh, you're right. You gotta, 
you got to always be curious and keep taking risks. So um, thank you. Thank you for your time, Ashley. This has been really fun and really uh, educational as well. And brand yeah, innovators. Anytime. <laughs>